Matthew 16 verses 13 to 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. As some of you may know, at the end of October, Joanne and I went to Malta for a week. It was the first time I'd actually visited since I was a child. And I was tremendously excited, not least because I was looking forward to seeing the island, but also it was actually our fourth attempt at a holiday, the previous three having been cancelled because of COVID. Anyway, when we finally got to Malta, the weather was not exactly as I remember it to have been. I remembered Malta as being this beautiful, idyllic, Mediterranean sunshine island and when we got there I think climate change or something had definitely had its toll because uh, the weather was far from good. Anyway on the sixth day that we were there we finally managed to get a day of sunshine so we packed up the car went off to the ferry and over to Gozo which is this absolutely idyllic island probably about 20 minutes half an hour from the coast of Malta just a quick ferry journey and it is beautiful there it was a lovely day I was absolutely champing at the bit there was one thing that I was determined to do it was to actually get into the sea and do some swimming and soak up as many UV rays as I possibly could Joanne at this point was probably let's say more passive about this plan but nevertheless she went along with it encouraged me so I got to this beach around the beach got into my swimmers and struck out uh, into the sea uh, after about 10 minutes I was aiming for a little what I thought was a sandbar about sort of 50 yards out to the sea after about uh, 10 minutes of attempting this I realized that there was quite a significant undertow the sea had calmed down but it hadn't fully calmed down from the storms of a few days before. Anyway, I realised that actually I just didn't have the strength to be able to swim back to the shore. Um, I was getting more and more short of breath. You know what it's like, you start swallowing bits of seawater and coughing a bit. I was getting really desperately short of breath, very, very weak and tired. But over to my right, there were some rocks. So I thought, that's what I'm going to go for. I'm going to go for those rocks. You know, it's like in, in a fairly rough sea, you're kind of flung up against the rocks and then sucked back into the sea. But I did finally manage to get a purchase on these rocks and clamber up onto them. And I sat there for about five minutes trying to recover my composure and my breath after this near death experience before I sauntered casually back onto the beach as if absolutely nothing had happened and I fully planned what they had just witnessed. I don't think I took many people in, there were some very worried looks. But anyway, I realised that actually God had allowed me uh, to see what I'd been praying for. If you remember last time I preached here, I preached about how I was asking God to give me an insight into something of the wrath of God, what it must be like to be unsaved. And here it was before me, a, 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 gr a graphic outworking of my prayer as I saw what it was like to be in severe mortal peril and danger and then to clamber with great relief onto the rock that was safety. And so here was a picture for me of salvation. So I've decided this week to actually preach on this little passage, uh, Matthew 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. Well, there's been some debate in there about whether Jesus was actually referring to building the rock on Peter himself, or actually building the rock on his confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I actually tend to go along with a bit of both of them, funnily enough. Ephesians 2, 18, uh, 19 to 20 says this, You are members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So actually, 
Peter gets in there, doesn't he? The church is kind of built on the apostles, but mainly on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But either way, we are built on something very solid and very unmovable. So the question I'm asking today is, are we building our lives and our church on the rock? Because, you know, all around us, things are moving and shifting. But are we being immovable? Are we on the rock? Today, as we're probably aware, is, um, is the Remembrance Sunday when we think about all the war dead and the staggering statistics of just how many people died during the various wars that there have been. I think it's true to say that actually 4% of the world's population, something like 75 million people, died during the Second World War. That is a staggering statistic, isn't it? Through That was through uh, carpet bomb, that's bombing, that's genocide, that's infection, starvation, as well as just being killed on the battlefield. But 4% of the world's population died. 11 million Allied troops died defending freedom against the axis that was coming against freedom, the axis of tyranny. And here was Churchill making this great speech on the 4th of June 1940, we shall never surrender. Well, we as a church are still in this warfare. It's true, isn't it? As we wake up each morning, we have to realise that we are still in a battle. Ephesians 6, 12, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul goes on, therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand and having done all things, stand, stand firm then. So this sort of triple uh, encouragement to stand and to, to hold our ground. You know, one of the rather quirky Old Testament stories that I absolutely love is about David's mighty men, particularly this man, Eliezer. And it says here in 2 Samuel 23, Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. It's interesting, actually, that it says that although it was Eliezer who stood his ground, it was the Lord who brought about a great victory that day. I think it speaks to us, doesn't it, that as we hold our ground, we can just allow the Lord to win his victory in whatever way he wants to in our society. Someone has written, and I love this, at the end of my life, I want it to be said that I fought with my hand frozen to the sword. Of course, the sword of the spirit Paul refers to is the word of God, the Bible. Let it be said of us that we died with our hands frozen to the Bible, that we were not shifting or moving from the living word of God, that we were going to stand and having done all things to stand on this word. So I want to look today at three areas of social uh, changes that are occurring around us. Firstly, our culture, which is moving and shifting. Secondly, social media, which has brought about sort of seismic changes around us. And COVID itself, which has shaken us to the core as a culture. So first of all, dealing with the culture around us, our Western world view. It's a very sobering verse, this one in Judges 2. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. This was the generation, of course, that had entered the land, you know, with Joshua, had taken Jericho, had fought these great battles about the, against the Amalekites and the, and the Moabites and the, all, all the ites and driven them out of the land, you know, had seen the Lord move on their behalf, incredible miracles take place. That generation, for some reason, I can't quite understand failed to pass the baton on to their children and their grandchildren. Somehow they dropped the baton and it says here at the beginning of Judges that another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And I wonder, can that be said of our generation? You know, are we in the process of dropping the baton of faith? If you're like me, then you are a baby boomer, someone born in this period between 1946 and 1964. 
um, baby boomers are what we call modernists. We kind of believe in absolute truths, the Judeo-Christian um, narrative of life. We believe in, in heaven and hell and the sin and right and wrong. And we were kind of inducted into these things right from infancy. And our, our parents taught us these things when we went to school. We actually sang hymns, often written by Wesley and other great people. We were taught the Bible in our divinity lessons. You know, we weren't taught other faiths. It was just Christianity. We were kind of brought up like that so that it was in our DNA. When Billy Graham came to Wembley and Haringey in the 1950s and 60s, all he was really doing was joining the dots for us. You know, we know about sin, don't we? We know about absolute truth. Then let's connect these two by Jesus Christ, you know, who can forgive sin and he took it on the cross and now we can enjoy heaven. And we believed all of these, we knew all this terminology and we just flooded forward to the front of these crusades. And I know there are people here today who actually responded in those Billy Graham rallies. But our generation is beginning to fade. And now we've got these millennials, these people born after 1981, who actually have not been brought up in what we might be termed a Christendom culture. They've been brought up in this postmodern culture, which has left Christendom well and truly behind. So modernists like us, we believe there's a grand narrative to life. We believe God actually has planned something. It has got a, a meaning behind a life in the universe and everything. We believe in absolute moral truth. Postmodernists believe there's no universal truth. They believe that truth is relative. They believe that intolerance has been the supreme virtue in life. They believe in identity politics. You know, I have chosen this as my identity and you have to accept that. And there's also something called intersecting injustices. This means that if you're in a minority group, if you've suffered some sort of injustice, then that gives you sort of credibility, gives you some sort of authority in, in our culture. And if you're in two or more minority groups, then, well, you've got true uh, credibility, even more so, power to you, because you're in two or three minority groups. And that's the kind of culture that we're in today. George Barner, uh, who does these big surveys amongst uh, sort of cultures, that did one in America very recently, published last month, October 2021, Millennials in America. Here are some of his findings. Only one third of millennials claim to believe in God. Just one third. A staggering statistic here, 39% of 18 to 24-year-olds identify as LGBTQ. Now, I think the UK is never far behind the USA. And probably, sadly, and this is probably the thing that worries me most of all, 49.5% of American adolescents aged 13 to 18 are reported to have one or more types of mental illness. You see, it's a great sort of sea out there, a great ocean that's shifting and moving. You know, people's identity is not given to them. They're, they have to choose their identity, even their sexual identity, their gender. You know, at the age uh, of five, six, seven, people are deciding which gender they're going to be. And it's incredibly stressful for them, so much more so than when we were children back in the 60s and the 70s. What is the Christian response to all of this? Well, the response is that we have to stand. And we have a right to stand, because actually we're standing for something that the postmodern world really wants and really values and really needs. First of all, identity. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We didn't evolve by random chance, kind of crawl out of the slime as an amoeba. That wasn't some divine cosmic accident. We're not, we're not like that. We're intentionally, purposefully designed and planned in the image of God, male and female, equal in God's sight, but with complementary roles. When it comes to injustice, things like Black Lives Matter, or the Me Too movement that the postmodern generation is so, finds so important Let's, let's point out as Christians that actually the Bible is probably the most anti-discriminatory text that has ever been written in the whole of humanity. Galatians 3.27, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor, there is ma- nor is there male or female. You are all one in Christ. I mean, what a great equaliser that is, the Bible. We're all children of God. We're all of infinite value. The gospel is that Christ, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're valued so highly. God sent his son to rescue us. And if we were the only person, as it said often in the, on the planet, God would have sent his son to die for you or you as an individual. If you were the only one alive on the planet, that is how highly we're valued. Each one of us equal in God's sight. Each one of us God's kids. Finally, freedom, tremendously valued in our culture. And here we are as Christians. We believe we have the key to freedom, the Bible, the rules of life. Jesus said this, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Freedom comes through these commandments, these rules and regulations in the Bible. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? But it's true if you think about it. It's it's the freedom of the rules of football that make it such an enjoyable game. If there were no rules in football, it would be mayhem. It wouldn't be enjoyable. It would be violent and unpleasant to watch and unpleasant to play. The reason we love sports, the reason we we value them is because they've got rules. You know, if if a ship wasn't in the sea, wasn't in water, it would be hopeless. If a train wasn't on tracks, it would be useless. You know, there is a designer, an intelligent design to this universe. And when you follow the maker's instructions that are in the Bible, then you will be most free and most joyful in your life. So we have the key to identity, the key to injustice, and the key to freedom, all in this wonderful truth that we follow in the Bible. Just as an example of someone, I believe, who stands in our culture, this man, Dan Walker, as you know, he's been presenting BBC uh, breakfast television since 2016. And uh, he's a born-again Christian, son of a local minister. And he has, right from the beginning, never worked on a Sunday. Media reports are inferred that his loopy beliefs stem from his fringe Christian groups. Walker has just stood his ground, calmly explained that he was simply a Christian who believes that God is behind creation. Since August, as you probably are aware, he's been on Strictly Come Dancing. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, he managed to avoid being in, any, in, that, in a Halloween special. We don't celebrate Halloween in our house, he said. And went on to explain that he wanted to set a good example for his children by living the standards that he teaches. When there was a media backlash about this, he said, I never mind what people write about me or say about me. Because as a Christian, I don't take my value from what people think about me. I know that I'm valued. Isn't that amazing? A man who stands like as a paragon, as a paragon of virtue, as a, as a plumb line of righteousness in our shifting culture. You know, I haven't even touched, of course, on the courage of Christians who are being persecuted across the world. As we know, 4,000, up to 4,000 Christians are martyred for their faith every single year. Our friends in Nigeria, about half of those martyred are in Nigeria. And we have friends there and relatives, don't we, in Nigeria. How, how ashamed we feel when we think of their courage in standing up for truth and standing up for their faith. When we ourselves so easily compromise, we so easily try and duck under the radar. We're afraid to put our head above the parapet, aren't we? Because... You know, we don't want to be noticed as Christians where these brothers and sisters of ours are being killed for their faith. Let's, let's take courage from them and their example and let's stand, and having done all things, stand in our culture. Be prepared like Dan Walker to really stand up for truth and let it be known uh, that we are Christians. Let's go on to the next thing, which of course is social media. The statistics about social media are fairly mind-boggling, aren't they? 3.5 billion people per month go on to Facebook or one of its subsidiaries, Instagram, Snapchat, you know, YouTube. But it's, it's just now virtually everyone we know has got a computer and is spending time every day on social media. 
It says in the Bible, doesn't it, that uh, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I mean, our assignment, if you like, as Christians is not to be uh, to go along, to go with the flow of, of culture and media, but to actually stand, to immerse ourselves in the truth, in the written word of God, and to be conformed to the pattern of Jesus, not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. And yet people growing up, of course, these postmodern generation, these millennials are growing up consciously or unconsciously being heavily influenced by what? Well, I'll tell you, by this, by artificial intelligence. You know, by, by these computers that are actually determined, run by algorithms that determine what should go on to social media. Are you an atheist? Good. Social media algorithms driven by artificial intelligence will make sure that you have your atheistic views affirmed and reinforced. Do you believe that Donald Trump had his second term of office robbed by, by election fraud? Good then social media will make sure that you have those beliefs affirmed and reinforced. Do you believe that COVID was due to 5G? Do you believe that Bill Gates is trying to sort of control us through a vaccination, vaccinating little microchips into us? Good, you will have all of those beliefs affirmed and reinforced by these algorithms on social media. It's scary, isn't it, when you think about it? Since 2015, the new statement has, has recognised this and called it an echo chamber. The echo chamber of social media is luring us into a cosy delusion and dangerous insularity. Why is this happening? Because news on Facebook travels through likes and shares. You don't share or like something that is not popular. So even if you kind of secretly disagree with something, you're likely to only share the popular things. And this is how it comes about that social media is just the tail wagging the dog. It's controlling our lives. It's nothing to do with real truth at all. And what's the implication for us as Christians? Yeah, we've got to get involved. We must get involved. You know, I was thinking of Jesus at the meeting the woman at the well. Jesus hung about in places where he was likely to meet people. If it was a well or if it was having a party with, with prostitutes and tax gatherers and sinners, he was there. He was with the people because he loved people, not because he was preachy and wanted to condemn them. He just loved being with people. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be where the people are, haven't we? No, the good news is that we no longer have to knock on doors in our evangelism. Do you remember those days? Those terrifying days when you had to go up and sort of knock on someone's door and give them a tract and try and give them the gospel. We literally don't have to do that anymore. All we need to do is get our phone out of our pocket and we can actually do evangelism literally into people's lives, straight directly like that. The bad news is that we are going to have to learn a new skill. For us, for many of us, this is well outside of our comfort zone, isn't it? Learning how to use Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, it's just something that is not naturally something that we are comfortable with and yet we've got to start learning, we've got to get better at this as a skill. And how should we do it? Well, most postmodernists are looking for authenticity. They're looking for real people. They're not looking for some great glitzy, glamorous wonder story of heroic success all the time. They're just looking for people who are real, who've had real struggles, real failures, who are really dealing with issues and be honest about it. What that everyone is humanity, we're all looking for love. We're looking for meaning and purpose. We're looking for community. So as long as we give people this in a sensitive way, uh, kind of salted with our Christian beliefs, then people will follow those who are feeding them with this good news that is releasing them and bringing them into freedom. The final thing I should say is that a couple of weeks ago uh, we had this change in focus, didn't we? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg decided to rename Facebook Meta. He changed the company name to Meta, which with a shift in focus to building the metaverse where we can virtually meet, virtually work and virtually play using virtual reality. <laughs> I have to say, I just cannot see this as being the destination of the church. 
You know, Jesus came as the incarnation of God. Karnos is a Greek word which means flesh. It's God in flesh. Colossians 1.15, the Son is the image of the invisible God. You know, God is invisible and ethereal and up there, but Jesus actually brought God into, into flesh. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. So in other words, when Jesus ascended back into heaven, he left behind him his body, the church. We are now the incarnation of God. St. Teresa of Avila was absolutely right, wasn't she, in 1570 or whenever she said this. Christ now has no body on earth but ours. Ours are the eyes, the hands, the feet of God. So we are the incarnation of God to this world now. And I think that is always going to be the same. God is not going to do things through virtual reality. He's determined that there should be real flesh incarnating his presence here. So I don't know about you, but during COVID, during the lockdown, I really missed worship. You know, worship is good on YouTube. You can get brilliant quality worship, something that might inspire you emotionally and kind of lift you up emotionally. But actually, it just doesn't touch you in the same way spiritually. Now, I do believe there's something, there's a dynamic of the Spirit that comes upon real people who are real temples of the Holy Spirit. And us as the church, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit in our community. And that God will send his real Holy Spirit to indwell real people in a real church so that we can go out with that message, that emboldened witness through the Holy Spirit to be actually uh, love our community and represent Christ to people <coughs> around us. Let's go on to the COVID pandemic. COVID has left challenges, hasn't it? Real death, grief, fear of death, crisis in the NHS and in social care, lost opportunities, lost job, economic damage, mental health, all these ramifications which will go on probably for the next 10 years. You know, it's radically shaken our culture and our society. There's been some good, a challenge to consumerism, the food banks have gained prominence, there's been a real recognition of frontline workers, supermarket workers and, and healthcare assistants. The spiritual values have kind of been recognised. Churches online have enjoyed increased uh, congregations logging into their services. And there's been a recognition of our interdependence one with another. During the COVID, I don't know if you remember this, the UK blessing, the blessing. It was wonderful, wasn't it? Very powerful song that went out just that when it was needed. I think Boris Johnson commented how good it was. And it was, it was a real sort of sign of, of God still being there, of the church of Jesus Christ still being in our community, God being alive and able to bless even despite the COVID crisis. However, what there hasn't been is the UK lament. You know, we actually had a hideous time. You know, Beacon, we have had a hideous time. We don't have to hide this or pretend it didn't happen. It was awful. You know, we started the COVID period by losing our dear, dear friend Paul. You know, that was tragic to us. We, we lost people who are young people. A lot of them moved away from the church. It seemed like BYG was just about to gain momentum. We'd just done that um, Jesus bus at the St. John Talbot School. It seemed like things were picking up. We had a great future. Numbers were building. And suddenly it was like all the wind got taken out of ourselves. A lot of our more vulnerable congregation couldn't come to church during the whole of that pandemic period. We lost some people simply because they got out of the habit of meeting together. It's been a real difficult time. And I don't think it's wrong. The psalmists were always very good at lamenting. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we lay down and wept. They were brutally honest with God. Lord, we've had a hideous time. And they weren't afraid to let God know. God wants to hear that. I think it would be good if there had been a, a UK lament as well as a UK blessing. You know, yesterday I was praying and uh, what I felt the Lord saying to me was, yes, you did indeed have the wind taken out of yourselves, spiritually speaking. That is exactly what happened. But he went on to say that needed to happen. 
Because actually the, the church needed to change direction. I don't know if you've ever done any dinghy sailing, but uh, as someone who's done a small amount of dinghy sailing, I do recognise that when you're sailing against the wind, what you have to do is tack, you have to go about. So you're, you're making tremendous progress and speed in this direction. You have to stop. You have to lose all the wind in your sails. You have to change direction. You have to wait. Everything's flapping and you know chaotic, and you're going still. And you're, you're, you're sort of you're not moving. And then and then the wind starts to gather on this side of the sail. You pull in the ropes called the sheets, and then you start to build momentum again, and you start going off in another direction. And I feel the Lord saying that is exactly what the church needs to do. Because actually, when I was a teenager, 19% of our population were going to church. Now it's down to just 4%. Ask young people, why is that? Why do you not go to church? And they'll say, because church is irrelevant. That's shocking, isn't it? It's not, I don't think, uh, that the truth we have is irrelevant, but the way we present that truth has become increasingly irrelevant to young people. We need to get back to that sharp relevance because we've got these astounding truths that are so needed in our culture aren't they these truths about identity about freedom you know about rights we've got all of it in the bible we need to let that be known and so let's be prepared to change direction let's be prepared to allow the wind of the spirit to fill us afresh you know the ruach the breath of god to fill ourselves and to set sail in this new direction Ready about Lee Ho. That's what you shout when you change direction, when you just tack a boat. So that's the cry of the church, I believe, at the moment. Ready about Lee Ho. Let's allow the wind of the Spirit to come into our sails again. At the end of my life, I want it to be said that I fought with my hand frozen to the sword. We're not changing truth. We're just changing the way we present truth. And let's be prepared to stand on this rock. And having done all things, stand, stand, therefore. I've got this final scripture for us. Philippians 2.15 is a picture of the beacon of a lighthouse on a rock. Prove yourself to be innocent and uncontaminated. Children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation, among whom you are seen as beacons, shining out clearly into the world of darkness. This is our call beacon. Let's stick to the truth and let's be prepared to be seen as Christians, like Dan Walker. Let's be bold and courageous, confrontational if needs be. Let's get involved in social media. Let's be involved in our culture and our society. And let's just allow the Spirit to do all he wants to do through us individually and corporately. Let's pray. Father, we just repent of the times when we have been compromising, when we've been staying below the radar, when we've not been prepared to put our head above the parapet. Lord, when we've not been prepared to be recognised and speak out as Christians in our culture, we've seen the devastating consequence of our silence. Lord, we, we, we repent that we've not been effectively handing the baton down to the next generation. So, Lord, we're asking you, would you forgive us? Would you restore us? Would you fill us afresh with courage, with love, Lord, with joy? Lord God, with the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be able to take truth into our community, into our culture, into social media, Lord, into this post COVID malaise that's hit our culture, Lord. Help us to come with the blazing truth, the joy, the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us again. Lord, anoint us and send us out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.